morning. My name is Peace Benedicta Comba from the Faculty of Science, Technology and Environmental Studies. I am the course instructor of OEZ 107, General Biology. This video will cover knowledge area one and it will focus on two main parts. The first one will discuss the origin of life and the second part will discuss the principles of classification. So, by the end of this video, you should be able to explain the origin and nature of life. You should be able to list the properties of life which are common to all organisms on Earth. Also, you should be able to distinguish the early organisms and the modern organisms. You should be able to explain the basic principles of classification and also to describe the system of naming organisms. So, let's begin with the first part of this video, the origin of life. The word life comes up many times in our daily conversation, but have you ever tried to answer the question what life is? Probably not because life itself is not a simple concept. However, if we try to look at the fundamental properties of all organisms on Earth, we may be in a position to explain what life is. So, the fundamental properties of life which are common to all living organisms. So, the properties of life, these are common to all organisms on Earth. The first one is cellular organizations. All organisms on Earth are made up of cells, and a cell is a basic unit of life. So, there are certain organisms that are made up of only one cell. These are called unicellular organisms. All their life processes occur inside a single cell. There are other organisms that are made up of more than one cell. These organisms are called multicellular organisms. In multicellular organisms, there are different cells are specialized to perform different functions. That is, there are some sort of division of labor. There are certain cells that devote much of their energies to perform one task, and other cells devote much of their energies to perform another task. There is some sort of division of labor. So, the cellular organization refers to the components of the cell. The cell components are also called cell organelles. So, there are also two types of cells. One is prokaryotic cells. All bacteria have prokaryotic cells, so bacteria are also called prokaryotes. Another type is eukaryotic cells. Organisms other than bacteria are eukaryotes. So the next property is sensitivity. Sensitivity refers to the ability of organisms to respond to the changes in the environment. The changes in the environment can either be internal or external. And these changes are also called stimuli. Different organisms respond differently to stimuli. Another property is growth. Organisms, for example, plants, algae, and some bacteria are able to use energy from the sun and to manufacture their own food. Other organisms that cannot manufacture their own food depends on other organisms for food. Another property is development. Multicellular organisms undergo specific gene directed changes as they mature and grow. 
Another property is reproduction. Reproduction is simply a process whereby mature living organisms give rise to new organisms of their own kind. And therefore, for organisms to reproduce, they have to be mature. So, reproduction can take two forms. There is sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction. In, asexual, in sexual reproduction, organisms, normally the male and the female parent must produce gametes. Their gametes, their gametes must fuse in order to form a zygote. So, a resultant zygote or offspring that is formed by sexually reproducing parents receive certain traits from both parents. One from the female parents, half of the characteristics from the female parents, and another set of the characteristics from the male parents. So, no matter how an organism looks like, all sexually produced offspring contain half of the characteristics, 50% of the characteristics from the male parent and another 50% of the characteristics from the female parent. Another property is regulation. All organisms on Earth have evolved a certain regulatory mechanism. Another property is homostasis. Homostasis is the ability of organisms to maintain constant internal environment regardless of the changes that occur in the external environment. And the last one is heredity. Heredity is simply the passing on of features from the parents to the offspring. As I have already explained in reproduction, heredity in heredity, for example, let's take an example in sexually reproducing organisms. In sexually reproducing organisms, offspring inherit certain features from their parents, from both the male and female parents, because they, they are both involved in sexual reproduction. But for the case of a sexual reproduction, offspring resemble their parents. So their offspring look exactly like their parents. Before we move to the characteristics of the LEF, it is the scientist estimated that the universe was formed 20 billion years ago and the Earth was formed about 4.5 billion years ago. And life originated on Earth about 4 billion years ago. So, let's look at the characteristics of the LEF at the time of the origin of life. So, temperature was very high. At the time of the origin of life, the air had very high temperature. And gases. There were light elements and gases, for example, methane, Ammonia, hydrogen, helium, and water vapor. Water vapor because all the water that was present because of high temperature, it evaporated and that it was in a form of a gas. Heavier elements, for example, iron and nickel were formed at the core of the earth. And also, ultraviolet rays from the sun favored the photochemical reaction. There were no molecular oxygen. So the LEF had no molecular oxygen. And because of that, the atmosphere was said to be reducing. So another question which is very important for us to answer is how life originated on Earth. So many people have tried to answer the question on how life originated. However, there are three main possibilities on how life may have originated. The first one is special creation theory. 
The second one is the extraterrestrial origin and the last one is the spontaneous origin. Special creation theory. The special creation theory suggests that life forms may have been put on earth by supernatural power or divine forces, that is God. So this it is hypothesized that a divine God created life on earth. So this is the basis of many major religions. For example, the Christians, the Muslims, and the Hindu mythology. So let's take an example from the Christians. According to Christ, according to the Bible, Genesis chapter one explains the origin of life, and it is written that God created everything in on the earth. He created plants and animals, but on the sixth day he created the first man and the first woman. So according to the Bible. The first one was Adam, and the first woman was Eve. So it was Adam and Eve that gave rise to all other organisms, all other human beings that we see on earth today. So according to Hindu mythology, they believe that their God with who was named Brahma created everything in the universe. So the, their God, Brahma, created the first man and the first woman. So according to Hindu mythology, the first man was Manu and the first woman was Shraddha. So because of this first man, because of this first man and woman, life was expected to proceed from there. And also, according to the Muslim, they also believe that the first man, Adam, and the first woman, Eve, gave rise to all human beings that we see on earth today. So this is special creation theory. And this is not, the special creation theory is not accepted scientifically because it cannot be proved. Then we move to the second theory, which is ex extraterrestrial origin. Extraterrestrial origin. So this is another theory that explains the origin of life. The theory of extraterrestrial origin suggests that life may have not originated on, on Earth at all. Instead, it may have infested the Earth from other planets. According to the hypothesis of Panspanian theory, suggested that life may have been, cosmic dust may have carried life forms to Earth, perhaps as an infestation of the spores to the Earth from distant stars. Another theory is the spontaneous origin. So, this suggests that life may have evolved from inanimate matters. So, certain life forms, for example, fleas could arise from inanimate matters such as dust, and maggots could arise from dead flesh. So, this theory was formed as a result of different experiments that were was carried by different scientists. However, it received a lot of challenges in, in the 17th and 18th century. But the, the scientists that posed these challenges did not have strong evidence to refute the theory. So until in the mid 19th century, by the experiments of Louis Pasteur, he refuted the traditional theory of spontaneous generation and supported the biogenesis theory. So the biogenesis theory that was proposed by the Louis Pasteur suggested that 
Organisms can only be formed from living organisms by reproduction. That means for organisms to occur, there must be living organisms that reproduce. So there, without reproduction, there will be no life. So this is the theory that is accepted by most scientists because it can be tested and proved scientifically. So, <clears throat> evolution from single-celled animals to complex animals. So, the microfossils. The fossils that were found in ancient frogs show progression from simple to more complex organisms, beginning at about 3.5 billion years ago. So, for at least 2 billion years, bacteria were the only organisms that existed. The archa bacteria, or sometimes called the ancient bacteria. So, Archibacteria is the word that comes from Greek, that means ancient ones. These are unusual bacteria. For example, the methanogens. Methanogens are methane producing bacteria. These bacteria are able to produce a certain gas that is called methane, and that's why they are called methanogens. So, the methanogens are among the first bacteria to be studied. They are the most primitive bacteria that exist today. They are simple in form and grow in oxygen-free environment. That means they cannot grow in the presence of oxygen. In fact, oxygen poisons them. So these were the first bacteria to exist on Earth. So the other bacteria resemble all other bacteria only in the following ways. They possess a hereditary machinery based on DNA. They also have a cell membrane which is composed of lipid molecules. It, they have an exterior cell wall and they have a, metabol a metabolic, metabolism based on NH carrying molecules which is called ATP. So the methane producing bacteria are the survivors from the time when oxygen was absent. So we have discussed the characteristics of the LEF and we said that the, the LEF had no molecular oxygen. So the methane producing bacteria, the methanogens, these are the survivors from the time when the oxygen was not present. Then we move to the second group of bacteria, these are called the new bacteria or sometimes called the true bacteria. So the most these are the most bacteria that live today. Bacteria, uh, these bacteria are capable of capturing NH of light and transform it into NH of chemical bonds. So one type of photosynthetic bacteria which is called the cyanobacteria or sometimes called the blue-green algae. These are able, they are called photosynthetic bacteria because they are able to carry out the process of photosynthesis, just like the plants. So they have chlorophyll. A chlorophyll is the red pigment that is found in the chloroplast. And this chlorophyll, the red pigment, is capable of trapping NH from the sun and use it in the process of photosynthesis to manufacture food. So the chlorophyll that is present in the cyanobacteria is like the chlorophyll that is found in plants and algae. So after the process of photosynthesis, oxygen is produced as a byproduct. So the oxygen which is produced as the result of photosynthetic activities help this bacteria to increase the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere. So when the new bacteria first appeared on Earth, because of their photosynthetic activities, they were able to, to increase the concentration of atmospheric oxygen from below 1% to the current level, which is 
21% in the atmosphere. So the increased concentration of oxygen increased the amount of ozone layer in the upper layers of the atmosphere. So the ozone layer is found in the atmosphere and because of the photosynthetic activities of the cyanobacteria the, and oxygen was produced as a byproduct of photosynthesis. The increased concentration of oxygen led, led to the thick, thickening of the uh, ozone layer in the atmosphere. So the thickening of the ozone layer offered protection against the ultraviolet radiations from the sun, which are very destructive to proteins, the nucleic acid, and also organisms that occupy the air. So, to, in, a, in a quick review, the first organisms that appeared on Earth are the archaebacteria, and that's why I call the ancient bacteria. These were able to, these bacteria were able to survive in the harsh environment of the early air, for example, extremely high temperature, but mostly the absence of oxygen. So when the new bacteria appeared on Earth, because of the photosynthetic activities and oxygen was produced as a byproduct, the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere increased after the appearance of the new bacteria. So the oxygen increased from below 1% to the current level, which is 21% in the atmosphere. So the new bacteria created a conducive environment for other organisms to live on air. So we move to the eukaryotic cells. We say there are two types of cells. One is prokaryotic cells and another is eukaryotic cells. The eukaryotic cells are much larger than the bacteria. They have internal membranes and have thicker walls. All organisms other than bacteria are eukaryotes. So the bacteria are prokaryotes and other organisms on Earth are eukaryotes. The early eukaryotes evolved to produce all other diverse organisms that inhabit the Earth today, including us human beings. So this is an example of a eukaryotic cell and we have different components. The first one is ribosomes. Ribosomes is a site of protein synthesis. And then there is Golgi bodies. Golgi bodies uh, contain certain structures which are called Golgi apparatus. And the Golgi apparatus uh, called the cell delivery system. So because they can transport materials from one part of the cell to another. So multicellular organisms. Organisms with more than one cells are called multicellular organisms. So when single eukaryotic cells began living in association with one another in colonies, they began to assume different duties. So the colony began to show characteristics of a single individual. Multicellularity fosters specialization. That means in multicellular organisms there is specialization. That is, there are certain cells that perform certain tasks and other cells perform different tasks. Then we move to the second part of this video, which is principles of classification. So there are about 30 million kinds of organisms known to science, and many more remain to be discovered, named, and classified. So out of 30 million known organisms, only 2 million organisms have been identified, named and classified. So you can see the gap. Yeah, there are 30 million kinds of organisms which are known to science and only 2 million organisms which have already identified, named and classified. So this is called out to us scientists, biologists, to 
discover more organisms, identify, name, and classify them. So, organisms that live on Earth are very diverse. So, their diversity is in terms of size, structure, mode of reproduction, the mode of life, ecological, but also geographical distributions. So, because of the diversity in nature of organisms that live on Earth, it becomes very difficult for biologists to study each organism individually. So, it is very important that classification is done so that organisms with similar characteristics can be grouped into one group and other with different characteristics can be grouped in their respective groups. So, it is very important that organisms are classified into groups so as to simplify the process of studying them. So, classification is, is very important for biologists because it helps scientists to study organisms in groups rather than studying each organism individually. So, there are mandatory hierarchy of the taxonomic ranks. So in descending series, these are domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So this is a descending series. But if you are asked to arrange them in ascending series, it means you start with the smallest one, which is the species. So you start with the species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, kingdom, and domain. So to help you remember it correctly, you can simply use this phrase. Danish King Philip calls out for good students. So Danish stands for domain, King stands for kingdom, Philip stands for phylum, class stands for call, order stands for out, Family stands for four. Genus stands for good and species stand for students. So Danish King Philip calls out for a good student. Nomenclature. Nomenclature is the process of giving scientific names to organisms once it is identified. So when organism is already identified, it is given a scientific name. So, a scientific name is universally used for a particular species or a group of organisms. So, common names were used for organisms, but it was very troublesome because one common name was given to different organisms in different parts of the world. So there was some sort of confusion. So scientists came up with a system of naming so that only one name is given to one organism. So that it is, it becomes easier to communicate between scientists in the world. So when they discuss a certain organism, they all go which organism is being discussed at a certain point. So, the formation and use of scientific names of organisms which are classified as animals are governed by the International Code of Zoological Zoologist Nomenclature. And those which are classified as plants, including the fungi, are governed by International Code of Botanical Nomenclature. So this govern the use of scientific names. Binomial nomenclature. Binomial nomenclature is a system of naming organisms whereby a, uh, an organism is given two scientific names. So each species is given two Latin names and hence called binomial. By means two and nomial means name. So binomial means two names. So the two names, the first one is generic name and the second one is the specific name. So the scientific name is written in italics when it is typed. 
So these are the elements which are used in writing and use of scientific names. So when writing a scientific name, normally when you are typing, the scientific name is written in italics. So the first letter of the genus name is always capitalized, while that of the specific name is never capitalized. It is written in small letters. So, for example, a scientific name of a human being is Homo sapiens. So this first letter, which is H, is written in capital, and the remaining letters is written in small letters. So, for example, if the name was to be written by hand, then it will be written by H will be capital, will be capitalized, but the remaining letters will be written in small letters. But the names must be underlined separately. So, we could underline Homo separately, and then in either space, we underline Sapiens. So, in a quick review, binomial nomenclature is a system of naming organisms and an organism is given two Latin names, the generic and the specific name. The generic name normally comes first. For example, the, the scientific name of human being a uh, Homo sapiens. Homo, this is the generic name and sapiens is the specific name. Also, when the scientific name is written in italics, it must be when we, when a scientific name is typed, it must be written in italics. For example, this Homo sapiens is italicized. And when you write by hand, the scientific names must be written must be underlined separately. So the names is only underlined when it is written by hand. But if you are typing, you, are, you do not need to underline, you just use italics. Then we move to trinomial nomenclature. So this is the system which is employed to name the subspecies. And the subspecies is also a Latin name and follows the name of specific to which it belongs. For example, there are two subspecies of Eastern Gorilla. One that lives on the mountain and another species that lives on the lowland. So in order to differentiate the two species, one that lives on the mountain and one in the lowland, the subspecific names are employed in order to differentiate the two species. For example, the eastern gorilla that lives on the mountain is called the Gorilla Berengay Berengay. So the first, the first name gorilla, this is the generic name, and the first letter is capitalized. The second Berengay, the second name, this is the specific name, and also it is written in small letters. And the third one is the subspecific name and it follows the name of the species to which it belongs. So, the eastern gorilla that lives on the mountain is called Gorilla Berengay Berengay. So, this is the generic name, this is the specific name, and this is the subspecific name. So, it is employed in order to differentiate the two species. And then we move to the second type of gorilla that lives on the lowland. On the lowland, the eastern lowland gorilla is called Gorilla Berengay Grawelli. So the first name is also is generic, the second is specific, and the third is subspecific. So the to differentiate the two species, the subspecific name Berengay and Grawelli have been employed in order to differentiate the two eastern gorilla. One in the mountain. Gorilla Berengay Berengay, and one in the lowland, Gorilla Berengay Grawelli. So, therefore, the full scientific name of the species is therefore trinomial. Trinomial means three names. An organism is given three names in trinomial nomenclature. Then we move to taxonomy. Taxonomy includes the 
the this is the setup that includes the description, identification, nomenclature, and classification of organisms. So there are two popular theories of taxonomy which are based on evolutionary processes. The first one is traditional evolutionary taxonomy, and the second one is the phylogenetic systematic, or sometimes called the cladistics. So the relationship between taxonomic group and a phylogenetic tree can take three forms. It can either be monophyl, paraphyl, or polyphyl. So a taxon is monophyletic if it includes the most recent common ancestors of all members of a group and all descendants of the ancestor. A taxon is paraphyletic if it includes the most recent common ancestors of all members of a group and some but not all descendants of that ancestor. And a taxon is polyphyletic if it does not include the most recent common ancestor of all members of a group. But in polyphyletic taxonomy, it can include distant relatives. So usually it requires independent evolutionary acquisition of a diagnostic feature. Then we move to traditional evolutionary taxonomy. So the traditional evolutionary taxonomy incorporates two evolutionary principles for recognizing taxa. The first one is common descent, and the second one is the amount of adaptive evolutionary change. So evolutionary taxonomy may either be monophyletic or polyphyletic. So phylogenetic systematics or cladistics taxonomy. So this approach was first proposed by the German entomologist who was named Will, Willy Henning. So he emphasized the criterion of the common descent. And he used the cladogram, which is the group which is being classified. And cladists denote common descent of different taxa. So sister taxa share more recent common ancestry with each other than anyone does with, the, with any other taxon. So this is the cladogram. A cladogram is a diagram that shows an evolutionary relationship between organisms. So this is the cladogram. At the top we have organisms, for example the hagfish. This is the perch, salamander, lizard, pigeon, mouse and a chain. And alongside we have characteristics that separate these organisms. The first one is jaws, lungs, claws or nails, feathers, fur and mammary glands. So in this cladogram, the jaws it, it means that that, that when we move to the first characteristics, which is the jaws, it means that all organisms from this point moving forward possess these characteristics, with, which is the jaws. Therefore, the perch, salamander, lizard, pigeon, mouse, and the chick all have jaws. But from this point moving backward, that means the hagfish does not possess these characteristics. So when we move to the second characteristic, which is the lungs. So from this point, moving forward, it means all organisms from this point, salamander, lizard, pigeon, mouse, and the chimp, all have possessed lungs. But from this point, moving backward, that means the hagfish and the perch do not possess lungs. Again, from the, when we move to the third characteristic, claws or nails, it means from this point moving forward, all organisms have these characteristics. So the lizard, pigeon, mouse, and the chimp have claws or nails. But from this point moving backward, it means the salamander, perch, and hagfish do not possess these characteristics. Then when we move to the fourth characteristic, which is the feathers. 
It means in this cladogram, all the pigeon, only the pigeon, have possess these characteristics, which is the feathers. But from this point, moving backward, all these organisms do not have these characteristics. But in mouse and chimps, they have. This is the last characteristics, which is the fur and mammary glands. So from this point, moving forward, it means the mouse and the chimp, they possess these characteristics, far or mammary glands. So from this point, moving backward, all these organisms do not possess these characteristics. So, in a quick review, a cladogram is just a diagram that shows evolutionary relationship between organisms. But also, it helps to, it separates, it shows characteristics of organisms, but also it shows the common ancestor of each organism. For example, when we look at the mouse and the chimp, we move back to the point where the two converge. So it means the mouse and the chimp share a most recent, a most recent common ancestor, which is probably an organism that is that possessed fur and mammary glands. And because these organisms are clo very close to each other than any other member of the group, it means these are more closely related. And when we move to classification, we can find the mouse and the chimp both belong to class mammalia. So they share more characteristics than the rest of the organisms in a cladogram. So also, when we want to see a common as ancestor of baby salamander and a lizard, then we move to a point where the two converge. So the, the ancestor of, the common ancestor of salamander and lizard is probably an organism that possesses lungs. It can either be living or probably already extinct. So, that is a problem. Then we move to the kingdoms of life. The earliest classification system recognized only two kingdoms of living things, which are animals and plants. However, biologists discovered other organisms, the microorganisms, and learned more about them. So the most, most biologists now use six kingdom system, and these are as follows. The first one is kingdom Archibacteria, which we, which is the prokaryote that love peptidoglycan cell wall, and it, it includes the methanogens. The methanogens are the methane-producing bacteria, the extreme halophiles, and the thermophiles. The thermophiles are bacteria which can survive under extremely high temperature. So the other bacteria is a kingdom that consists the is composed of the unusual bacteria, those which can survive in extreme environment. So the next one is U bacteria, which include the true bacteria, and this is the prokaryote with peptidoglycan cell wall. For example, the cyanobacteria, which are also called the blue brain algae, and these are photosynthetic. Nitrogen fixing bacteria also are uh, example of bacteria which follow fall under this kingdom. Pathogenic pathogenic bacteria are also called the disease causing bacteria. For example, Vibrio cholerae, the bacteria that causes cholera. Salmonella type, the bacteria that causes typhoid. A lot of bacteria which cause diseases fall fall under this kingdom. So another kingdom is kingdom protista, and this is, they are eukaryotic, they are primary unicellular, although algae are multicellular. Photosynthetic, they can either be photosynthetic or heterotrophic, that means under kingdom protista, there are certain organisms that are photosynthetic, that means they can manufacture their own food. And other organisms which are heterotrophic, that means they cannot manufacture their own food, and therefore depend on other organisms for food. 
So examples of organisms under kingdom protista are Amoeba and Paramecia. Another kingdom is kingdom fungi. These are eukaryotic. They are mostly multicellular, although yeast is unicellular. They are heterotrophic, that means they cannot eat their own food and therefore they depend on other organisms. And their fungi feed on dead or decaying matter. They are usually non-water, they do not move. They are organisms with cells of cheating, such as mushrooms. So they have a cell but their cell is different from other organisms because theirs is made of cheating. So another kingdom is kingdom plantae. This includes all the plants. So all plants belong to kingdom plantae. They are eukaryotic, they are, their cells are eukaryotic. They are multicellular, that means they have more than one cells. They are non-water, plants are fixed, they cannot move from one point to another. They are usually terrestrial and photosynthetic organisms. They carry out the process of photosynthesis because they have a green pigment which is called chlorophyll, which is found in the chloroplast. So examples of organisms which belong to kingdom plantae are trees, grasses, and mosses. And the last one is kingdom animalia. So all animals fall under this kingdom. They are eukaryotic, their cell type is eukaryotic. They are multicellular, means they have many cells. They are motile, they can move from one part, from one place to another in search of food because they cannot make their own food. Males and conducive environment. They are heterotrophic, that means they depend on other organisms for food. Plants and animals. Organisms that belong to kingdom Animalia are sponge, spiders, newts, penguins, and human beings. So this is the end of the video. Thank you for watching.